All right, it looks like we've got people coming in. Good, yeah, we'll, we'll start in a moment, everyone. All right, we're gonna get going. My name is John Horning, and I am the Executive Director of Wild Earth Guardians. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We have guardian supporters from all over the country taking part in this call. And today I am gonna start a new tradition of calling out uh, longtime members and supporters. Uh, there are two in mind uh, today. One is Candace Russell, who's a monthly donor who lives in Arizona. And the other is Judith Embry, who's from Massachusetts, also a monthly donor. Thank you for joining us and thanks for your support. Um, now more than ever, it's great uh, to have these opportunities for us to connect with our membership, especially because we're of course dealing with a global pandemic um, and an unfriendly presence in the White House who divides at a time when it would be great to have someone who was a unifying force. Lots of social upheaval as well. And so um, it's just good to have these opportunities to get together to remind ourselves of the values that unify us. Um, in these Wild Earth webinars, we bring together um, all kinds of folks, national issue experts, people from frontline communities, elected officials, and Wild Earth Guardian staff to talk about critical issues at a critical time. In case anyone needs a reminder, this is a critical time. We're 34 days away from the most important election in our lifetimes. The purpose of these webinars is to inform and inspire and activate guardians like you to help us confront powerful extractive industries and demand greater leadership from our elected officials to solve the nature and climate crises and create the kind of world we want. Today, we'll be talking about the Trump administration's very public and lesser known efforts to systematically dismantle our nation's most powerful environmental law, the Endangered Species Act. Um, this is of course just one part of other efforts on the part of the Trump administration to shred our nation's environmental safety net. The US Fish and Wildlife Service's efforts to dismantle the Endangered Species Act are ongoing. The agency is taking public comments until October 8th on yet more regulatory changes designed to gut the Endangered Species Act. This rulemaking is focused on weakening the critical habitat provisions of the law. With me today to discuss these matters are Jimmy Tobias, environmental reporter whose writing appeared in The Guardian, The Nation, High Country News, and as of this morning, again, Sierra Magazine, and Taylor Jones, longtime Guardians Endangered Species Advocate. Welcome to both of you. It's good to have you. Thanks. Glad to be here. Thanks, John. Yeah. So I want to start just by asking each of you to briefly introduce yourselves and then share why endangered species matter to you or why are a, a particular species is, is significant to you. Taylor, why don't you go first? Sure. So as John said, I'm Taylor Jones. I'm the endangered species advocate. I have a background in conservation biology um, with a master's in conservation from UW-Madison. And I've been with Guardians about 10 years. And during that whole time, I have been working extensively on writing Endangered Species Act petitions to get species listed under the ESA. And I've written on everything from the very unprepossessing Rio Grande chub to the much more iconic and well-known Joshua tree. And I find all of these species fascinating because they're all parts of a whole. And one species that really has captured my heart is the wolverine, 
and I hope I'll get to see them listed because I really admire their indomitable spirits and I want to save some strongholds for them in the lower 48. Great. Hi everyone, I'm, uh, I'm Jimmy Tobias. I'm a reporter for The Guardian and The Nation and other outlets um, where I mostly cover public lands and wildlife and the U.S. Interior Department. And before that, I was a trail worker uh, on the Nez Perce National Forest in Idaho um, for a few years. Um, and one of the species I'm really obsessed with right now is the Florida panther. I'm working on a story about it. I got to go down to Big Cypress earlier this year in search of the panther. Didn't see one, unfortunately, but I did. Uh, my my trusty Park Service uh, guy did make me a like a cast of a pin uh, of a of a um, paw. I don't know if you can see it, but yeah, That's I just. Cool. It's kind of, it's now one of my prized possessions. I also really like ospreys because I think they have um, a great lifestyle. It's cool. Well, thank you for sharing that story, Jimmy. And thank you, Taylor, for sharing your connections. It's always, I think, just nice to ground uh, the audience in why these things matter and our personal connection to them. So, um, so many, so many ways in which we feel isolated in these times, these challenging times, and it's good to remind ourselves of our, our deep, deep connections to place and creatures. So thank you for that. I want to start with, with um, I mean, I imagine most of the audience knows that the Trump administration is, is quite hostile to the Endangered Species Act and Endangered Species. Um, and it's, it's particularly trouble, troubling given that we're in the midst of the sixth great extinction. What do you believe uh, is the most sinister thing that the Trump administration has done to weaken protections for endangered species? And I'll, I'll volley back and forth here when I have a question for each of you. So Jimmy, why don't you go first this time? Sure, yeah, I think, I mean, I think one thing that's going on now that isn't necessarily the Trump administration, but has been a trend for a long time is just the continued um, kind of collapse of Section 7 of the ESA. Almost never does the Fish and Wildlife Service call Jeopardy on anything. And Jeopardy is its most, really its most potent tool, in my opinion, in the, under the law. It's, it's, the, it's the provision of the law that enables the agency to actually block bad developments. And it almost never does. Um, and the Trump administration has continued that trend uh, and even supercharged it. But I think, I mean, for me, like, I really abide by that saying that personnel is policy. And I think that the personnel that have been put in place by this administration are probably the single biggest problem. And I'm not just talking about the many figures at the Interior Department who are openly hostile to the law, but also all the federal judges, uh, et cetera, who will be with us long after this administration is gone and who, um, you know, I think are probably also hostile to the law. So um, I think the personnel is, is the central problem, I would say. Yeah, we'll get to some of those personnel uh, in a little bit. Before I come back to you, Taylor, Jimmy, can you in a sentence or two describe sort of what Section 7 is, maybe a paragraph to give some of our, our audience an understanding of why it's significant? Sure. Um, Section 7 is the part of the law that enables consultation. So basically, when an agency, when a federal agency is permitting or building or allowing some sort of large project, whether it be on federal lands or elsewhere, they have to go to the Fish and Wildlife Service and basically get his permission to do the project. Um, basically, they, they go to the Fish and Wildlife Service and say, hey, are there endangered species in the area we're building this project? And if so, how will our project impact the species? And if the project jeopardizes the survival of the species, the Fish and Wildlife Service is obligated by law to block the pro to offer alternatives. And if there mm -hmm. are, are if there's no al good alternative, to block the project. And um, it just almost never does, even if a project is yeah. really, really bad. And, and that's not just the Trump administration that's been going on for a long time, but um, yep. it's a major, major problem. Yeah, Section Seven is where. The rubber meets the road. It's 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 the most I would argue like the most critical provision of the law, and I've seen this trend happening for for decades now, where 
you know, a river is being dried up, a species uh, population is on the brink, and yet the federal uh, agencies, both the action agency, in this case, the Bureau of Reclamation and, and the Fish and Wildlife Service, somehow can conclude that that everything is hunky dory. It's it's very very frightening. So, Taylor, what about you? What what do you see as the most sinister thing the Trump administration has done to the ESA? You know, it, it would be hard to pinpoint any one thing. I would say it's the cumulative impact of this series of regulatory changes to the act that we're going to talk about a little bit later in this webinar, but just as an example of their of those regulatory changes impacts on the ground let me tell you a little bit about the meltwater lednean stonefly this is a tiny tiny insect but it's huge in terms of what it indicates it depends entirely on the namesake glaciers of Gl glacier national park and scientists are predicting that those are going to be gone within the next few decades if we don't do something about climate change so since those insects live in the remote mountains of a national park, climate change is pretty much the only threat they face. But in the listing rule, the administration completely sidesteps the issue and they double down on the logic they relied on during the listing of the polar bear, saying that addressing climate change is outside the scope of the ESA. And that's something that they've been doubling down on in all these regulations. They're making it much harder to look at um, climate change modeling, they're making it harder to protect habitat for species impacted by climate change. But I'm hoping that with enough pressure, the agency will rethink that position. So we continue to petition for species that are threatened primarily by climate change. It's not surprising that the Trump administration, given all the climate denial that characterizes um, uh, all of its actions, that that would, would be reflected in this, this decision and many others. I think what's probably surprising to our, our audience here is that that policy was first started under the Obama administration. And so it, it is troubling to see these trends of, of, of bad policy um, preceding um, all of the, the bad stuff that the Trump administration has done. Um, just Shifting gears slightly, um, uh, you mentioned, Taylor, the, the big regulatory attacks, which we'll get into. Beyond those big kind of public, highly visible ones, what are some of the, the lesser known actions that Fish and Wildlife Service and Interior have taken to undermine the law? Jimmy, to, to you on this one. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've been working on a couple of big stories on the Fish and Wildlife Service for a while now, and I've talked to a lot of recently retired um, officials and employees there, and they all pretty much say that morale is at rock bottom. A lot of times, you know, people talk about retiring early. They sometimes people I'm talking to, you know, break into tears because of how bad. Jimmy's frozen on the word bad there, while hopefully we get him back in a second. Taylor, do you have a sense of, you know, what, what are some of the maybe lesser known, not quite as highly visible actions that the Fish and Wildlife Service or Interior have taken that, that are undermining the law? As, as a top. He's back. Can you, am, I, am I back? Was I? Yeah, you were frozen for about 30 seconds there, but um, okay. why don't you continue? Yeah, I, I, what I was saying, I think when I froze was that um, they made it a priority to delist and downlist uh, species. Um, you see that from public records, you know, continued delistings is often mentioned as a top priority. Um, and those have been institutionalized at the regional levels, including the Southeastern region where the officials there are under a mandate to downlist, delist or deny listing to 30 species a year. So, you know, those are some of the quieter things that are going on. Yeah. Isn't this crazy? Just think about this for a moment. This is an agency that is charged with protecting our nation's biodiversity, and they have policy and goals, and I imagine like performance measures to systematically strip away those protections. That is just, uh, just deeply disturbing. 
when you shared that. I didn't actually know that because it's the Southeast region and yeah. Guardians isn't focused there, but it's both not surprising and, and totally shocking to me that, that that's real policy on the ground. Um, Taylor, any, anything to add about this question of um, something that may be a little below the radar? Well, I would just say when we look at the numbers, if you're comparing administrations, the Obama administration listed uh, 42 species per year. The Bush administration listed seven per year. The Trump administration so far has come in even below the Bush administration. They've only listed maybe four or five a year if you average it out. So building on what Jimmy said, there's definitely a an emphasis on delisting and doing those actions rather than listing the backlog of species that need protection. Crazy. Do you have a sense, uh, Taylor, of a, of a species that is in the waiting queue that hasn't been listed um, that, that needs protection? Well, I would, I, I would talk about the Joshua tree, actually. Mm -hmm. This is a species that was denied listing by the Trump administration. It was one of the, um, along with the meltwater lead and stonefly, it's one of the first species to come out um, after the new regulations. And what happened with the Joshua tree, um, the vast majority of climate models indicate that the trees may lose up to 90% of their range within the next 100 years. So like Glacier, Joshua Tree National Park might lose its namesake. But the service basically ignored those models and um, in favor of, of their own analysis. And they're just ignoring the science on climate. Yeah, yeah. Another, another reinforcing story about how climate denial is married to um, the complete indifference to the loss of biodiversity. Um, I wanna shift now to talk about some of the, the characters and individuals responsible for implementing um, the systematic dismantling of the act. Uh, if there's one person not named David Bernhardt, and for those who don't yet know, he's of course the Interior Secretary, who's responsible for undermining the law at the Interior Department or the Fish and Wildlife Service, who would that be and, and what are they doing that's damaging to either individual species or the act itself? Why don't we start with you, Jimmy? Um, yeah, I would, I would have to go with, I mean, there's a lot of folks to choose from, but I'd have to go with Daniel Giorgiani, who's the top lawyer at the agency. And he's a former, uh, you know, he's a former operative for the Koch brothers, some of their organizations, um, very kind of a smooth talking lawyer. He, uh, he was involved in rolling back the, uh, incidental take, take protections from the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. He's been instrumental in the agency's crackdown on the Freedom of Information Act. Um, he, uh, he also spearheaded a lot of the, the administrative rollbacks of the Endangered Species Act that um, I think we're gonna talk a little bit more about later. But, you know, for instance, there's this, you know, he, he helped get rid of the um, blanket 4D rule, which was a, a, a regulation at the agency to give threatened species you know, a series of blanket protections until the agency could write plans for each species. So it was just a good solid rule that protected threatened species. And they rolled that back. Um, he was involved with that. It was a policy priority for, you know, right wing groups like the Pacific Legal Foundation. They had his ear and other people's ear at the agency and they got what they wanted. So um, I would have to go with him probably just because he's got his hands in all of the legal maneuverings going on at the department. Yeah. Um, I want to take a moment to remind all of our listeners that we like to take questions. Um, and I'm going to, um, I think we've already got some in the chat box. I'll do a question or two now, and then we'll save our last five to 10 minutes for questions as well. This one just popped up. So I'm going to read it to you, Taylor. This person, um, uh, Jose de Artega, 
I'm an advocate for court-involved youth uh, in DC, and I wanted to ask Taylor if she might be interested in a project where my youth could help you with an ESA petition, learn about the species, the process, et cetera. Um, so to you, Taylor, what do you think? Oh, absolutely. I would love more help with petitions and I would love to reach out to youth in DC um, and get them more involved with some of the really cool species that we have both in that area, but also since we work mainly in the West, there's a lot of species that they might not know about um, or encounter that they could really learn a lot about. That would be really great. Great. Well, let's make sure the two of you get connected. I would, I would love to see uh, those youngsters that you're working with, Jose, um, have the opportunity to work with Taylor. Sounds like it could be a great, um, great, great project. Um, we have one more question I want to introduce and again, encourage all the audience. And this one I'm going to put to either one of you to think about. I'm not sure um, that you have an answer, but from Michael McLaughlin, perhaps discussion of genetic bottlenecking resulting from inappropriate downlisting to allow understanding of how dangerous that might be. Do either one of you have a thought about that where genetic bottlenecking is an issue for, for species and the agency is, is ignoring that or uh, again, inappropriately downlisting a species? Taylor? Well, let me just explain for our listeners what um, genetic bottlenecking is. That's when you have such a small population that they um, start losing genetic variety and can't respond um, evolutionarily to changes in their environment. So that's definitely a concern. Um, the first example that comes to mind is the black-footed ferret, who um, the species was down to, I believe, 18 individuals and was brought back from by a captive breeding program but they have to very carefully sort of match up the different ferrets to avoid uh, genetic problems so if a species is downlisted or delisted too soon then you lose some of that um, some of that careful analysis for example, if the ferret was delisted, um, they might lose funding for the, for the captive breeding program, or they might, um, there might not be as many research dollars for conserving these animals. And it's particularly for species that are still in the wild and difficult to track, um, like ocelots or jaguars. On, near the border. Um, it's very hard to track these guys. It's very hard to tell if they are having genetic problems in their populations. So the more protections, the better in those cases. Yeah, you know, one thing I want to add to this, and it relates back to the number of species listed, is that when you, when a federal agency and a federal administration denies protection, you're creating the kind of genetic problems that Taylor spoke to because the longer we collectively wait to list a species, the more these genetic issues come up. And I'm very familiar with the Mexican gray wolf in the Southwest where, you know, we acted, um, if not too late, um, we, the Fish and Wildlife Service, waited very long until there were only a few species. And it, it just speaks to the problem of of extinction, that um, there, this is an incredibly high stakes game. And when you wait until there are few numbers of species, um, it's, we're, you're gambling with extinction. So anything to add briefly on that, Jimmy? Yeah, I mean, the, the species I've been focused on recently is the Florida panther. I mean, and that is a species that yeah. is all ha, has um suffered from genetic bottlenecks in the past and was revived by an agency effort to introduce uh cougars into cougar genes into his population um but the species is still at risk and the science says that in the future it will require more genetic interventions because there's just not enough of them and even though the the species already 
you know, is going to have genetic problems in the future, that hasn't stopped the Fish and Wildlife Service from greenlighting all sorts of developments in, in important panther habitat over the years. And so it's, it's not so much, it doesn't have, this doesn't have so much to do with um, being downlisted, but it has to do with Section 7, which we were talking about earlier, and the fact that the agency isn't applying uh, Section 7 as it should, um, even though species like the panther are at risk already uh, for genetic problems in the future. Yeah. Disturbing. Hey, I want to return to the question we had before to you, Taylor, to give you an opportunity to answer. You can pass, um, but because I know your work doesn't necessarily deal with this, but is there, um, are there any people in the agency that, other than Bernhardt, that you think are, are responsible for um, sort of more harmful impact to the law or species in your dealings? And again, if not, I'll, we can move on. Yeah, I would pitch that back to Jimmy. It's, it seems like he's got a lot of good stories about behind the scenes stuff. We, we talked about this. I, let's throw it back to you, Karen Bud Phelan. Talk about her. She's someone mm -hmm. I've done battle with over the years. Yeah, I, she is, um, she's been described as like a darling of the Sagebrush Rebellion. That was a quote from an article. She is a long time, um, yeah, member of the Sagebrush Rebellion. She's an attorney from the West who represents primarily represents ranchers and agricultural interests um, on all sorts of different topics, but she's sued over the Endangered Species Act and Endangered Species Act protections in private practice for many, many years. She was associated, I believe, with the Mountain States Legal Foundation, which was also run by William Perry Pendley um, and backed by oil companies and the you know, Coke Alliance groups, things like that. And now she um, is the Department of the Interior's one of their top lawyers working on Endangered Species Act issues. And when you read through her calendar or, you know, records related to her, you know, she's got, she's deeply involved in um, many of the regulatory changes we're talking about, including making it harder to designate critical habitat for endangered species and all sorts of other decisions um, related to listings and section seven consultations and other things. So she's one of the key people running the show and, um, you know, she's obviously uh, committed um, ideologue uh, and a, a staunch opponent of the Endangered Species Act. Yeah, just a little historical perspective. The, the very first Endangered Species Act lawsuit that I was involved in was in 1995, and it involved a suite of southwestern species um, that had been listed to that point that were being harmed by cattle grazing. And so we filed a lawsuit against the Bureau of Land Management for their failure to consult under Section 7, and Karen Bud Phelan uh, intervened on behalf of the New Mexico cattle growers, making all sorts of crazy legal positions that the law didn't apply to them. And so I have been well aware of Karen Bud Phelan. And it's, again, it's one of those things where I just find it shocking that a person with such, such um, transparent, outspoken hostility to the Endangered Species Act would be in the position that she's she's in. So let's let's shift gears a little bit here and talk um, about information and access to information, which I know is is a cornerstone of actually both of of your work, um, whether it's through reporting or trying to gather information for the basis of petitions or other work. Um, there's a federal law that, that many activists rely on across all actually progressive and conservative uh, wings um, called the, excuse me, the Freedom of Information Act or FOIA. Um, what's the Trump administration doing to, to weaken FOIA and allow more secrecy and deny disclosure? I know you've got firsthand accounts of this, Jimmy, but then we can come back to you, Taylor, as well. Yeah, they, they've throw, thrown up all sorts of roadblocks to FOIA. Um, I, I think for our discussion, the most um, relevant is that in September 2018, the Fish and Wildlife Service, Fish and Wildlife Service headquarters sent a, a guidance out to um, its offices around the country, um, basically um, instructing them to take a less transparent approach when dealing with certain Freedom of Information Act requests. Specifically, it, it encouraged uh, the FOIA officers around the country to consider withholding more information, including drafts 
PowerPoint presentations, um, email communications, uh, meeting notes, things like that, that specifically are about the, the application of the Endangered Species Act. And so in encouraging, in sending this guidance and encouraging their offices to release less to the public about Endangered Species Act decisions, I think the intent there is to undercut um, groups that are trying to hold uh, the, the agency accountable around its decisions. So a lot of groups will file FOIA requests in preparation for filing a lawsuit over what they view as a bad decision about an agency species, the scientifically ill-informed decision. And they rely on the Freedom of Information Act to get information uh, to inform their lawsuits and prove that the agency has done something wrong. And I think this guidance is meant to stifle the flow of that information and make it harder and harder for reporters and groups to inform the public or file lawsuits around ESA decisions. Taylor, what's your, what's your take on an experience with FOIA under this uh, administration? Yeah, so what Jimmy is describing is exactly what I was doing for the Joshua Tree lawsuit where we are challenging the denial of listing for the Joshua Tree. We submitted a FOIA request and um, it's sort of uncertain how much of that information is transparent or not. Um, it's very hard to tell these days. And so I'm concerned with this, um, with this issue of transparency because I wanna be able to bring the strongest case possible. And to do that, I need the internal workings of the agency and they need to be transparent about that. So not having reliable certainty that that's what's going on, it's very disconcerting. Yeah. You know, I've seen this for years too, um, and it's just worse, of course, under the Trump administration, but, and it relates, relates back to what you were saying, Jimmy, about um, longtime staffers just breaking down, feeling so emotionally distraught because when, when, as a staff frontline officer, you feel like you can't even tell it like it is. It, uh, it's just so demoralizing and, and stifling. And so there's a way in which the FOIA policy and um, the kind of um, context of fear that has infiltrated the agency is, um, is uh, it's just so 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 demoralizing. So it's not just the the obvious attacks on the law itself, but these um, more subtle attacks on FOIA that can have a, a demoralizing effect on on agency staff at, at all kinds of levels. So I'll just say also, yeah, um, yeah you know, FOIA is um, oddly enough, I think beloved by people across the political spectrum. And I think it reflects a cornerstone of, of what at our best we love about our democracy, which is a government is accountable to the people and some degree of transparency uh, is, in our, our, is in the people's interest. And so this, this stifling ultimately may serve this administration, but it, it's corrosive to our democracy in ways that are, are profound and we see it in many other forms as well. So I wanna shift gears Absolutely. to uh, the front door attack on, on the ESA, probably the most high profile and visible attacks on the ESA. Um, and um, just why don't you Taylor describe both what has happened in the last 12 months and what is going on now and um, in terms of the full frontal regulatory dismantling of the Endangered Species Act by the Trump administration. Sure, yeah, it's, it's death by a thousand cuts. There's, there's two rounds of changes to the ESA. One was finalized and one is proposed. And the first round of changes did a whole lot of things. But the highlights, or maybe the lowlights, are that the regulations make it easier for companies to build roads, mines, other industrial infrastructure, enlisted species habitat. And that's part of Section 7 that Jimmy described earlier. 
Um, they allow the service to include information on the economic impacts of listing during the listing process. Now, that is bad for species like sage grouse, who are threatened primarily by industries like oil and gas drilling. Once you start even mentioning economic impacts, politics starts getting involved in these listing decisions that are supposed to be based entirely on science. So even just opening that door is a bad move. Um, the regulations make it more difficult to protect the habitats of species that are impacted by climate change. And they, like Jimmy was saying earlier, they remove a bunch of protections from species that are listed as threatened. And that's particularly bad for species like the wolverine that have yet to get protections. Um, we're expecting the listing of the wolverine any minute. And if they are listed as threatened, they will not have the same level of protection as they would have before these regulations came into play. So the two new proposed changes on the table right now are both um, about habitat. One changes the definition of the word habitat in a way that limits protection of areas that need restoration. And the other would change critical habitat regulations in a way that would grant the federal government really sweeping authority to exclude areas from protection just on the say so of extractive industries like oil and gas drilling. Um, so it gives them a lot more authority to anoint people experts and then just um, follow their say so. Yeah, it's uh, finding myself at the moment just like, oh God, it's amazing. Um, it's amazing the um, just the, the multi frontal attack uh, from the regulations, the FOIA stuff, the, um, the sort of attacking of, of agency. Um, I mean, I think this is the most sinister thing of, of the Trump administration, and we see it in all the civil service and all the, the varying um, agencies from the FBI and the CIA to other departments, like good people getting bullied and harassed and um, um, it, it makes me kind of shifting from how I'm thinking about this conversation. Um, how, what, what do you, what do the two of you think, um, if there were a democratically appointed interior secretary, what are, what are the things that that person and that position could do to restore the ESA and protect imperiled plants and animals? And, you know, don't, don't give me two things because it's a long list. What, what, what needs to be done to restore the faith, the heart and soul, and the, 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 the sort of the overall regulatory structure to ensure that this incredibly visionary and powerful law has the kind of impact that most Americans want? And why don't you start, Jimmy? Yeah, I mean, apart from rolling back some of these these attacks uh, that have happened over the last four years, I think the most important thing is really they need to get someone in there to lead this agency and to lead the Interior Department and and at the White House too, um, in terms of advisors. They need people who understand the law, who are passionate about wildlife, who understand the severity and urgency of the extinction crisis, and who know what they're doing. I mean, they just need new leadership in this agency. It is become, um, these problems aren't all, they do not all have to do with the Trump administration. They've been, some of them have been going on for many, many years and they need like dra they need drastic reform. Um, and, they, and so they need new leadership. But apart from that, which is sort of like a, you know, a broad thing, there are specific regulatory changes that could happen quickly. Um, one of them is back in 2008, David Bernhardt, when he was the solicitor at the Interior Department, when he was the department's top lawyer signed this memo here that basically barred the Fish and Wildlife Service from um, regulating the climate impacts of greenhouse gas emissions. And it has tied the agency's hands on greenhouse gases ever since. And the Obama administration never bothered to rescind this memo. Um, and it's something that could happen, you know, on January 21st, but in a new approach to dealing with greenhouse gas emissions. And then it would open the agency's um, open up the agency's ability to deal with all these species threatened by climate change. And then the second thing is, is way back in the Reagan administration, 
they defined Jeopardy in a very limiting way. Um, and to remind you, Jeopardy is um, basically the provision within Section 7 that enables the Fish and Wildlife Service to block bad projects. But the Reagan administration made it so that it was really hard for the agency to actually call Jeopardy on, on things. Um, and so, the, you know, this might be two in the weeds, but a, a new administration go, could go in there and redefine Jeopardy more in, align, more in alignment with the way the Endangered Species Act envisioned it and thereby enable the Fish and Wildlife Service to call Jeopardy much more often and protect species in a much more aggressive manner. So those are two simple fixes that wouldn't require an act of Congress that an, an interior department leadership could do right away that needs to be done. And, and frankly, that the Obama administration should have done and they didn't. So those are a few of the things that I think need to happen immediately. Um, yeah. yeah. Taylor, bef before you answer that, thank you, Jimmy, before you answer that question, I wanna give our participants a chance to pro provide their input on the rulemaking that's ongoing. Um, we've got a petition on our website. I'm hoping Taylor can post it to the chat box so that everyone on this call can ensure that uh, their voice is heard. Uh, even in these challenging times, I think we have to remind ourselves to speak up, speak out, stand up, and, and dissent, uh, if, if nothing else. And so I hope that each of you will take the time to sign that petition and, and ensure that the Trump administration um, hears your opposition to uh, this ongoing rulemaking that would further weaken the Endangered Species Act. Uh, but back to the question at hand, and then I'll get to a few questions from uh, the audience members. Um, your thoughts on what, what needs to be done to, um, to restore faith and, and the strength of, of the act. Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about Congress and what they could do. Um, because I just put a link in the chat. I put two links in the chat. One is to the comment period on the ESA critical habitat regulations. And the other is about a bill that's in Congress right now that would reverse that first round of regulatory changes that I talked about. Uh, good acronym, Protecting America's Wildlife and Fish in Need of Conservation Act, or the Paw and Fin Conservation Act. So passing that would go a long way toward undoing some of the damage. And the other important thing is that the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Endangered Species Program needs to be fully funded through the appropriations process. The agency is starved for funds. They've been starved for funds for years. Um, and it's estimated that to truly recover all the species they have listed, they'd need at least $486 million. And in 2020, they got about 122 million for listing and recovery. So about a fifth of what it's estimated that they would need. So the chronic underfunding needs to stop. And that's particularly important now that COVID has made clear the links between healthy connected wildlife habitat and human health. We really need to prioritize wildlife conservation much more than we have been. We need to put our money where our priorities are and for a lot of reasons, but not the least to prevent future pandemics. Great. Well, thank you for um, highlighting those two points of, of action for everyone here today. Get to a couple questions and then we'll, uh, from, from audience members. This is from Christine Resch. I'm terrified of what will happen if Trump gets reelected. What do you think will be the end result in terms of ESA and species of another four years of Trump? I went from let's think about what's possible to let's talk about um, what would be horrible. I mean, reflect on, offer your reflections on what, what would be the net effect to the Endangered Species Act and more broadly to stemming the extinction crisis if Trump had another four years. Jimmy, you wanna go first or? Sure, I, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think um, one of the biggest projects of a second term of the Trump administration would probably be really to, you know, seed these agencies with people they find um, 
ideologically palatable. So, you know, the civil service actually like reshaping the civil service in their own image. I mean, that's a long-term project and I think that would be a major um, next step. They haven't fully been able to get there. Um, and I think they would have a much better ch shot at it and with four more years. Also, you know, obviously, you know, re completely remaking the federal bench. You know, I think a, a long-term project of the property rights movement and, and the right wing is to get the ESA, um, key parts of the ESA declared unconstitutional. Um, specifically, they, uh, they want to use the Commerce Clause to say that, um, that species that only reside in a single state can't be regulated by the federal government because they don't, uh, you know, they don't live on both sides, you know, across state lines. And so they want to, and, and like something like 70% of all listed species reside only in a single state. So basically, they want to use the Commerce Clause to remove federal protections for 70% of the species. Um, that are currently listed. And I think, you know, with what's happening at the Supreme Court, with what's happening in the federal courts, um, and with, you know, there, there are groups out there who are, have waged years long campaigns um, to, to go after key provisions of this law, and they haven't really succeeded because of the courts, but they really could, especially if another four years, um, especially if the administration gets another four years in office. So I think that's some of the long range threats that, that you know, we could see coming down the, coming down the road. Yeah. Taylor. I would, sorry, go ahead. No, you. I would agree with all of that. I think we will continue to see this very slow rate of listings. If not even slower, we will continue to see erosion of the most strongest protections of, that the ESA provides to species through regulatory changes. Um, and, you know, our response to that has always been, we'll see you in court. And with Trump administration court appointees uh, sort of towing the line in terms of ruling against environmental protections, that's going to be a lot harder if there's another four years in which um, the courts could get packed. Yeah. Oliver Starr, longtime Guardians member and e-activist, is also asking us to talk about Amy Coney Barrett, the Supreme Court nominee, and her impact. And I think both of you just spoke to that. So just wanted to note that. Just one more question here, um, and then we'll get to some others. Uh, this is a brief one. Economic impacts, this is from Michael McLaughlin, uh, McLaughlin, economic impacts were expressly verboten by ESA. Were they not? That is in decision on, on listing. So Taylor, could you clarify when economic impacts are supposed to be considered, when they're not, and what the changes entail? Yeah, sure. So the ESA requires listing decisions be made solely on the basis of the best scientific and commercial data available. And the word solely is very important there. That was added in the 1982 amendments to the act uh, to sort of underscore the idea that economic or non-biological considerations should not play a role in listing decisions. But what the service is proposing to do is they're going after another clause um, there's a phrase that follows this without reference to possible economic or other impacts. And they are, they are removing that. And so that opens the door to cost benefit analyses to, to sort of inject themselves into the act. And the agency insists that, oh, they're not going to make decisions based on economic impact. They're just going to talk about it. But to be perfectly frank, I don't believe that for a second. The um, economic impacts always get wrapped up in these discussions and always um, cause politicians to jump in to protect um, the interests of people who are giving the money. And it's, it's just going to cause a whole lot of problems. You know, this is, I just want to add, this is one of the, um, to me, the most inspirational aspects of the act that it basically at its 
essence recognizes the intrinsic value of all species and that decisions to list species shouldn't think about economic impacts. And um, I just find, you know, the original vision of the act is quite profound, quite inspiring and uplifting that there was a time when the Congress of the United States would pass a law that recognized our moral and ethical responsibility to care for all creatures. And uh, it's, um, you know, it's been under attack for, for many years and definitely and in quite intensively over the last three and a half years. But the vision of the framers of this law is, is just quite a beautiful one. I wanna, um, before we get to a few more questions, Taylor, just ask you to, to speak to uh, Guardian's efforts to defend the law in federal court. I know there's lots of different efforts. If you could highlight a couple, because I want to leave our audience with reassurance that we're doing everything that we can to protect the law uh, and certain species uh, in the federal court system. Yeah, as always, if the administration wants to fight, we will see them in court. Um, the first thing we've done, we've joined a coalition of groups that are challenging the first round of regulatory changes. So the ones that I mentioned earlier, not involving habitat, but involving section seven, removing protections from illicit species. We are challenging that whole package of regulations. That case is currently in progress. We will keep you updated. Um, I mentioned we're also challenging the service's refusal to list the Joshua tree. And um, we're also letting the Fish and Wildlife Service know that they're losing in the court of public opinion. Every time that these regulations come out, the public has a chance to comment. And we collected over 12,000 signatures on the last proposed regulations weakening habitat protections. And we're hoping to do the same for this round. So once again, find that link that I posted in the chat, sign your name to our comments, and we will get those into the agency. Yeah, just to add to that, the Fish and Wildlife Services comment period closes on October 8th. And so let's uh, make sure our voices are heard and we overwhelm the agency, as Taylor noted, demonstrating that public sentiment is still very much uh, aligned with us in our belief that we have a, a, a moral and ethical duty to, to protect um, all the magnificent creatures with whom we share this planet. Um, just in our last uh, six, seven minutes here, one or two more questions from, uh, from our audience. This one's from Kim Crumbo. Can we provide a list to the Biden transition team of things our new president can do in the first 100 days of administration. So before either you, Jimmy, or Taylor takes that question, I want to note that there is not yet a Biden administration. So if you haven't or are uncertain about the importance of voting, please do so. Um, so this question is presuming a, an outcome of that election. Uh, is that something that, uh, but in response directly to the question, Taylor, uh, and then maybe Jimmy, can we provide a, a list to a new administration about things they can do in the first 100 days? Oh, absolutely. I believe that a coalition of groups is already working on that behind the scenes. And um, as far as I know, that's going to be a big focus for the transition team um, for for anyone who's in contact with the transition team is going to be providing ideas like the ones we talked about earlier, how to strengthen the ESA rather than tear it down, um, actions that they can take without with and without congressional approval. Um, yeah, that's definitely something that is that is happening. Yeah, great. Jimmy, that's not your area of, of um, sort of expertise, but anything to add to that? Sure, yeah, and sorry I had to turn off my video. I, uh, my internet's a little spotty today. Um, you know, I, I think 
one of the most important things will be not, you know, not any specific policy, although there are many good policies that could, could be put in place, but who is leading the agency and who's leading the department. Um, I've heard people say that like during the Obama years, you know, he had all sorts of different environmental policies, but wildlife wasn't really a top priority. And, and I've heard people say that there was really no air cover coming from the White House for ESA decisions because ESA decisions can be very politically controversial. Um, they can be, uh, they, you know, they can cause fights. Um, and so the key will be getting someone, people in the White House, people in the Interior Department and people at the Fish and Wildlife Service who are willing to fight for this law and the species it protects. And, you know, because none of the policy lists, you know, are going to matter unless those people are in place. And so I think the first step is identifying, you know, fresh voices uh, who are outside the normal, you know, the normal bureaucracies and beltway groups who can really bring a new vision uh, for this agency in the 21st century when we're facing a, a, an extinction crisis that's only getting worse. Yeah. You know, I'll say one thing that I'm heartened by that's um, been sort of resurgent in terms of messaging in the last four or five years is um, a recognition that the extinction crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and the climate crisis are interwoven. And I think um, that's just been heartening to see whether or not there will be political will in a new White House to actually, as you say, Jimmy, provide air cover on highly politicized or highly political decisions obviously remains to be seen. One or two more questions, but one comment I wanted to share from Peter Koppelman, who says, I was in charge of ESA litigation at the Justice Department in the Clinton administration. Just wanna say, excellent program. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Taylor, for an excellent program. Um, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Here's one of them from David Lynn. Uh, have you seen any specific adver adverse court rulings based on Trump's current judicial appointments? So I, I think we're talking about in the ESA context. I know neither of you are lawyers. Um, Maybe next time we'll have a lawyer on the, the ESA webinar that we do in five weeks. Um, but Taylor or Jimmy, aware of any of Trump's current judicial appointments who've issued decisions adverse to the ESA and or listed species? Yeah, unfortunately, it's not my area, but I think a lot of those cases are still working their way through the system. And so we may start seeing that more and more as they as those cases come to a conclusion in the future. Yeah, it's not you know I'm I, I'm not a lawyer either, and I think it's like a little premature. But I do think that um, the dusky Gro gopher frog decision, if I if I remember it correctly, the Supreme Court sent there was a there was a fight over what could be considered critical habitat, um, and it was it was a lawsuit that was brought in part by the Pacific Legal Foundation, which is a right-wing group funded by all sorts of dark money foundations who are kind of the, the principal um, anti-ESA litigation group in the country. And they brought this case with others. Um, I think Warehouser, the timber company was also involved. Anyway, the court was deciding whether the agency could designate an area as critical habitat that um, wasn't currently able to support this, a species because the habitat wasn't uh, and so to a lower we, court we were losing you a little Jimmy provided um, the impetus and the cover that anyway that can Well, we're, we're, you're, you're sort of popping in and out, Jimmy. Um, we're, we're basically at time as well. So I want to thank um, you, Jimmy, for joining us. Uh, really respect and admire all the frontline journalism you're doing on behalf of endangered species and public lands and all these critical issues. Appreciate you joining us as well, Taylor.
Thank you so much. These are um, just absolutely critical times for our nation and for the natural world. Um, we obviously have someone in the White House who's inflaming tensions, exploiting the vulnerable, and um, <clears throat> acting in so many ways that divide. And um, I hope that uh, each of you that um, have an appreciation for the natural world will do your part to vote come November 3rd and, um, and to continue to stand up in all sorts of different forums that protect the natural world. So thank you for all the questions and thank you again, Taylor and Jimmy for, for joining us. It was a, a great conversation. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you. We'll look forward to seeing everyone a week from today when we have our next Wild Earth webinar on some critical public lands and uh, issues relating to national monuments. So thank you again. Adios. Thanks.